Well, as already mentioned, today is the seventh day of July and it's the first of four Sundays in the month that we have with hope-filled optimism called Miracle Month. It's a month of deliberate leaning upon the faithfulness, the limitless supply and generosity of our great God and Father. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is impossible with our God. Nothing that is except the things that are contrary to his nature, of course. We sometimes forget this, but there are some things that are logical impossibilities outside of the boundaries of reality. For example, the foolish questioning of the limitations of the Almighty's power that some critics put forward with this real harebrained question. If God has the power to do absolutely anything, can he make a rock so huge that he cannot lift it? The thought is logically inconsistent. It's outside the bounds of re rationality. It actually is a nonsense question. It's like saying, would you please draw a square circle for me? It just doesn't exist. God isn't stupid. God doesn't do stupid. And God doesn't do anything else that is out of character. For example, God is holy and pure. He does not sin. Indeed, he cannot sin. You see, sin is transgression by the created ones against their creator. Romans chapter 3 reminds us that every person in this world is a sinner and has transgressed against God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now it is impossible for the Holy One to sin. God cannot transgress against himself. He is subordinate to no one. He has no one to cross. He is and ever will remain sinless. That's one thing that's impossible for God. And a second example of God not acting contrary to his nature is that he cannot and he will not lie. God is truth and only ever speaks truth and only ever acts with integrity. It is impossible for God to lie. I don't know about you, but it gives me great comfort, in fact, in knowing that God is completely true to his person and will never act out of character. And all the more so in this exciting month of July, where I'm anticipating seeing the God of whom it is impossible to lie and break a promise, to do impossible things on his people's behalf, impossible things for us. When a thing happens that is outside of human intervention or natural laws, we call it a miracle. When God intervenes to break into the natural world in supernatural ways, whether it's, whether it's recognized by us or not, a miracle has taken place. And this month, as a church, we're reaching out to God and we're asking him to break into our natural, into our normal, and to grant us a miracle, or two, or three, as many as, as he will give us. Now, are you feeling a little uncomfortable? You don't need to be. Because as a believer in Jesus Christ, as one who has come by faith and repentance to his cross, you have been the recipient of the greatest and most significant of all miracles. Your physical birth followed the nat natural flow that God has established in nature. Your physical life was a naturally derived thing. That doesn't diminish the immensity and wonder of it, for God 
is ultimately behind his creation of you and all of life, and life is an incredible miracle in itself. And since your birth, you've been born again by God. This birth is into a life that lasts forever, where you've been born spiritually into the family of God, not naturally, but supernaturally. And death and hell no longer await you, but glory and joy forevermore. This is a miracle. This is the greatest miracle we could ever be the recipients of. You and I are no strangers, therefore, to the miracle working power of God. We have all experienced at least one mighty miracle from God if we belong to him. But we in this month are actively seeking his power-filled working in our lives, our church, and our friends' lives. Look at our text for this morning in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now this verse is actually not a definition of faith. It's a description of faith. For example, when we believe on Jesus as our Saviour, we put our full confidence in him that he will save us to the uttermost. Faith is trusting in him completely, that his offer and promises are true, realising that there is no other way we can be saved there is nothing else we can lean on, put our trust or faith in, including ourselves or our own goodness. There's none of that. We trust completely in Christ, his promise to redeem us. We hope with full assurance then that our pardon, which we cannot see nor hold in our hand, is actually granted to us by the promise of God. See, these things are all invisible. We do not see them. But faith is confidence in what we hope for, confidence in our Saviour's promise, and assurance about what we do not see, assurance that we are born again, assurance that we have inherited eternal life and a place in God's family as his son or daughter. And we're convinced by faith that our heavenly home awaits us in eternity, though our eyes have never caught even a glimpse. And so our faith, in, just in this, in our salvation, is described in verse 1. And we find in our reading that faith is not optional with God. It is essential. Verse 2, this is what the ancients were commended for. The great men and women of old pleased God by their leaning in faith on the Almighty. This was the only means by which uh, God was pleased in them. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. That's an incredible verse. An incredible concept is encapsulated in this verse. You see, science, for all its trying and all its bragging, cannot tell us what caused all things to exist, to come into to being. Science has no answer for how that happened. But God can tell us, and he has, he created it all. He told us of his glorious feet. And by faith, we accept it. And because God only speaks truth, we have confidence that the universe was formed by him. And we have assurance about what we did not see. We didn't witness it, but we have this assurance. And being made righteous before God required faith going as far back as Adam's son, Abel. Verse 4, by faith, Abel brought God 
a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he's dead. And so, right back when it comes to righteousness and being uh, cleansed, uh, blood sacrifice was made by faith, it pleased God. And Abel was accepted. Cain, hmm, not so much. He didn't have it right. But faith, faith was the key. And Enoch had full and confident trust in God. And the Lord was just so pleased. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. What an incredible gift that was. Uh, he could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. The whole chapter of the book of Hebrews talks about faith and gives us examples of heroes of the faith like Enoch, just showing us that without faith it's impossible to please God. And that's where verse 6 takes us. It gives us this key truth. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. We cannot please God without trusting him. That's what faith is, trusting. We cannot please the one who created us and the one whom we have offended and insulted and, and sinned against without faith, without trust, without believing him when he tells us who we are, what we've done and what he has done in order to forgive and cleanse and restore us and to give us life in place of death. We must believe because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We must believe. We must believe that he is who he said he is. He is the one and only true pre-existent one, the God, the Lord, the creator of all, the sustainer of all, and the saviour of all who come to him, believing that he will cleanse them. He rewards those who earnestly seek him. And we wouldn't seek him if we didn't believe that he can help us. We must have faith. It's essential that we may even live. We must believe him as our saviour or we cannot be saved. We must trust our life and soul completely to him. There is nothing we ourselves can do but believe. Our daily lives as Christians then are to be lived, believing, trusting, leaning on God. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 said, For we live by faith, not by sight. We live as ones redeemed by faith. If we can already see a thing, then no faith is required. No waiting trustingly for it to materialise. And in this miracle month, we're all encouraged to participate in order to explore and discover firsthand the power and provision and trustworthiness of God and grow by a faith in it. We've all been invited to experience the miracle working power of God in salvation. And I believe God invites us to trust him for those things that we need that we may experience his miracle, miraculous provision. I would love for each one of you to consider prayerfully before the Lord what miracle you're going to pray for. Will it be a money miracle? The provision of extra finances to give back to him and into his work through the church? If so, how much would be a true step of faith for you? Faith, trusting and believing 
for something that's bigger than you, bigger than you can handle. Might it be a spiritual miracle that you will persistently seek his face for this month? Perhaps a miracle of redemption. Not your own, if you're already redeemed, but if you're not, that would be the best, in fact, the only place to start, your own redemption through faith in Christ. But I'm thinking of the miracle of redemption for a loved one to come to Christ. Maybe years of prayers and sharing the gospel finally coming to fruition in miracle months. That would be a miracle, wouldn't it? It's one thing I am praying. That's one of my miracles is for my mother-in-law, for Debbie's mum, who for longer than we've been married, Debbie and I have prayed for, shared the gospel with, and we long for that miraculous moment. Perhaps this is the month. It could be a miracle of deliverance for yourself or a friend or a neighbour, perhaps to be delivered from an addiction, maybe of substance abuse, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, vaping. Who knows? These addictions are not good. Or a different sort of addiction, maybe like pornography or unhealthy overeating or digital device addiction or anything else that robs you of your joy in Christ and deepening your relationship with him and just keeps on defeating you and your spiritual power and joy. And it's just been something that you've just never been able to shake. Perhaps a deliverance from an addiction is what you will ask him for in prayer and faith. Perhaps your miracle won't be a financial or a spiritual one, but a medical miracle. Will you be trusting the Lord to do a work of divine healing this month? Healing for yourself or healing for another? In Sunday for Kids, uh, last week, the children heard the story of the woman with the constant bleeding who thought to herself, if I can only just touch the master's garment, even just the hem, the very edge, I'll be healed. She did, and she was. Absolutely incredible. Her life was transformed through the miracle healing of the wonderful Lord. Or is there another miracle that you yearn for the Lord to give you, something I've not mentioned, but God's Spirit is whispering into your heart and is saying to you, maybe even against your basic in instincts, ask me for this need to be met. Trust me in this because I promise to meet the needs of my children. I encourage you to be a participant in Miracle Month, not just a spectator. Now our natural heart, which is a little bit fearful when it comes to trusting, is to inclined to not step into this, not expect a miracle, not pray for a miracle. You're probably yearning for one, wanting one, but to commit to one, and that's a that's different. That's maybe a step too far. And you just want to sit back and watch and see what God might do for others because you just don't feel you've got the faith to do it yourself. I can understand that. This is, you know, this is tentative ground because we're not walking by faith, uh, by sight here. We're walking by trust. Can you trust God? Do you trust God? Don't hold back to see if God does something amazing for someone else and not you. That won't build your faith anywhere near what having your own bold prayers answered will do. I hold to a belief that stands behind my promptings for the church to hold a miracle month. You see, I believe... God desires strongly for us, his children, to grow in trust of him 
more and more to the point that he will not dishonor faith genuinely placed in him and his promises. He wants us to grow in faith towards him and his promises towards us as we take those first steps we find that God is true to his word and he's standing right there with his strong arms ready to catch us I mean what father would take his little toddler and stand him up on the edge of the table and just step back and say jump jump daddy will catch you what father would make a promise like that and then as Junior takes a step off the edge, pulls his arms back and steps and lets him crash to the floor. A, fa a, a father would not do that. He wants his child to trust in him, trust him with his life. And what God, who says as a loving father, I will meet your needs, now launch out into the deep and then let you crash to the floor. I don't believe he'd do that. He's a God of love. He's a Father who cares for us. What are you going to be trusting God for this month? Now, I want to speak a little more to the topic of the financial or the money miracle, if you like, uh, this morning. Should you choose this? As I've attempted to explain in a lead-up to this month, I've I've just tried to say this is not a call to get everyone to dig deeper into their reserves and give that money to the church. It's rather an encouragement to follow the Lord's direction to actively trust him to meet his people's genuine daily needs, the needs of his church family, uh, the needs that we have every day. Um, and our financial giving to God is part of our discipleship and it's all part of giving to his work and to the continuation um, of, of his local church family in this community. Now we need to understand that as God provides financially for us, we respond to him in faith and trust by treating the money as being entrusted to us rather than given to us. Every dollar that crosses your path, that ends up in your bank account or your, your wallet or purse, is not yours. <laughs> it's God's. And he's passing it through your hands. And we are his stewards, his financial servants, and we need to act faithfully in this role. We're instructed to return some of the money to the Lord as a form of thanksgiving for his generosity and of worshipping him with the goods at our disposal. This is our normal uh, duty of stewardship. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 and 7, Paul says that there are two basic guidelines for how to give back to God as stewards of what is given to us. This is in our general giving. The first is that we are to give back to God generously. Verse 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You see, a farmer must harvest a crop to sell if he is to make a living. That's how he makes his living. He plants the seed and he harvests the crop. And as a farmer, when you plant the seed, there is no guarantee that the season will turn out well and you grow a good crop. Ask me about this. I grew up on a farm, I know. And if you risk only planting a little seed, you will only reap a small crop, even in a great year. If you risk a lot of seed, then in a good year, you reap a bumper or a bountiful crop at harvest time. God says it's the same in spiritual things. If you're scared of risk and you give sparingly or stingingly back to God, then the harvest God will give back to you can only be small. See, what you don't realize perhaps is that when you give back to God, you are sowing seed. You think it's the end of the process. You've done the work, you've gotten paid, and now... To end the process, you give some of it back to God. Actually, no. 
It's kind of the beginning of the process of the next round, as it were. And you sow back, and God will bless. That's where the rest comes from. If you give to God generously, he's able to give a bumper crop of spiritual blessings in return. So let your giving cost you. Give generously. That's the first principle of regular giving. The second principle that we see in 2 Corinthians 9 is in verse 7. God tells us to give cheerfully. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, if you notice here, there's no specified amount given. Now, we know in the Old Testament that they, they practiced tithing, which was 10%. Actually, it was more than 10%. It's a good study to do to find that with the other givings um, that were also uh, required and encouraged, it was way more than 10%. But we're not told in the New Testament how, as believers, um, how much we should give. No one decrees how much you are to give. The amount is decided by yourself, by the believer. You should never feel forced to give to the Lord's work. If the reason you give money or any gift to God is to ease your conscience or to impress others or because you feel pressured by anyone at all, including God, then you're actually giving for the wrong motive. God's not impressed at all by an unhappy, stressed-out giver. Rather, he loves people to give cheerfully, happily, as an act of the free will. God wants you to choose to give to him. Rejoice that he has blessed you with good things, which enables you to return some back to him. Okay, those are the brief basics of Christian giving to God. So let's try and understand the principles behind the financial challenge done in Miracle Month. Philippians 4.16, Paul commended the Christians in Philippi saying, even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid, financial aid, again and again, when I was in need. Then in verse 19, Paul states, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul was telling them, you have given generously to the Lord's work. You've been supporting me, and the Lord has seen that, and he makes sure that you will not go without, and he will meet all of your needs. And how can he do that? He's got um, a bottomless storehouse of supply, endless glorious riches. Give to God and he will give to you enough to take care of every need. And the first part of verse 8 in 2 Corinthians verse 9 says the same. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times having all that you need. Now note that in all things and at all times, that's quite comprehensive, isn't it? God provides everything you need. And then notice an amazing promise from God to you, continuing in verse 8, back in 2 Corinthians. Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So do you understand what this is saying? After God has met all your needs, you've, you've given, and God meets all your needs. He, he supplies all your needs. He gives excess. He actually gives more than you possibly need. He is so generous. He gives it to you, but not for selfish use. But he gives it to you so that you can give more. For unselfish dispersal, he gives it's for you to do godly work, work in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Paul expands on this to make it really clear that God gives abundantly above what we have asked for in terms of our daily needs. Verse 10 to 11. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food 
also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way. Notice the extra above your daily needs that God supplies to you. Okay? He will also supply and increase and enlarge and you will be made rich in every way. Now that's not all just in physical things, it's in every way and it talks about and in righteousness. So there's spiritual blessing and you'll grow richer in the blessings that God gives too. The extra above your daily needs God will supply and notice the reason why he does it in verse 11. So that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So what happens when you pass that money, that excess or increase, along to others in need? Well, God meets their needs. He gives them their daily bread through you, through your generosity. And because God has worked through you to answer the prayers of those who have been in need, the people helped give praise and thanks to God for answered prayer. And you become an answer to prayer for people who are praying, God, give me this day and my daily bread. God answers their prayers through other believers. And you are one of those other believers. God didn't drop the manna from heaven to answer their prayers. Instead, he gave extra to you so you could pass it along and be the means of answered prayer for someone else. That's how God usually answers your needy prayer. It normally comes through someone who God has blessed, tapped them on the shoulder and says, pass this along. He gives to others who then pass it on to you when you ask God to supply your needs. And when you are the means through which God answers others' prayers, you grow spiritually. I think it's always helpful to remember that no one can outgive God. He is the greatest giver. Are your resources greater than God's? Can you give to him more than he can give to you? It's just not possible. God is very generous. And he knows when we give for the right motive and the right reason. There is danger in people taking the generosity of God and thinking, okay, here's a fantastic money-making scheme. I'm going to give to God. He's going to give back more to me. I'll give to God. He'll give back more to me. And if I do this enough, I'll soon be rich. You know, I'll be driving a Ferrari before long. That's actually, that's, that's not giving to God. That's selfish driven that's that's seeking um, the wealth that's seeking the gift instead of the giver and uh, I don't think God's going to honor that um, we look at some TV evangelists and we wonder at times uh, but then um, the shallowness of the spirit in a lot of that comes to to, to light God is great a, a gracious and a generous giver he is the greatest. In fact, God knows what you need before you even need it and what you're going to ask for before you even ask it. And in miracle months, if you are led this way to trust in God, pray and ask the Lord to place in your heart a figure, a sum that you hear the Spirit saying, trust me in this, trust me for this amount. And uh, this, this amount is over and above your normal, regular, weekly giving, it's a sum to stretch your trust in God. It's not money we already have, but money that can only be given to the church if God first gives it to us. As God gives us an amount to trust him for, as he places that in our minds and our hearts, it will probably be rather scary at first. We might say, oh no, God, that's, that's too much. I can't promise to give you that much money this month. I don't have that much. Oh, hang on. That's the point, isn't it? I don't know where it would come from. Ah, that is the point. It will be from you, Lord. It's supposed to come from you. 
He's not telling you how much money you're to give him. He's telling you how much money he's going to give you to pass on. That's the increase, the abundance he wants you to trust him for. However, the money collected is not the key benefit of Miracle Month. It's just it's a tool, if you like. It's, it's something substantive for which we have trusted God and he has rewarded that trust, that faith, and he will build our faith through it. That is the key. It's the increase of our trust in God as our boundless, generous, miracle-working provider. That is the reason behind that. That is the purpose behind that. And especially as we know of the tremendous generosity um, of John Wignall and, and John Reed, who gave money to the church uh, in their bequest, we know that God is supplying our needs so fantastically. So it's not the money. It's about trusting God with the money that needs normally to flow to meet the needs of his work. And whatever you lean in, trust upon God to do this miracle month, may God answer you with a miracle and increase your faith. The verse I'd like to leave you with, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these closing words that encapsulate the heart of your message to us this morning, that all things are possible with you. Nothing is impossible with our God. And uh, you own the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine, as the old hymn goes. You own the riches of this universe. Uh, so money is not an issue. You are the healer. You are the one who even restores to life, raising from the dead. You have the power to heal. So God, the limits, they're just not there but it's according to our need. And so we pray for this Miracle Month. God, would you just show us what we are to trust you for? And Lord, teach us to pray. Pray believing, pray in faith. Looking to you, looking with faith, fulfilled expectation. Not just wanting these things to happen, Lord, but seeing them by faith as already been received, even though we haven't received them yet. We thank you, Lord, because you want to draw us closer to you in loving trust as a father with his dear child who has promised to supply every need. We commit ourselves, our, our prayers, our hopes, our, our faith to you this month with joyful anticipation of what you will do. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.